and welcome back to Cinema Wellman. I'm your host, David, and if you're watching on YouTube, you'll see that I'm uh, dressed up for this special episode. Um, I'm still wearing pajama pants, of course, but it's the thought that counts. Uh, the special attire is because this episode will reveal Cinema Wellman's official Oscar ballot. Um, everywhere you look these days, you'll see Oscar predictions from everyone, kind of all at once. Um, what you'll get here today are not predictions. I honestly have no idea who's going to win, nor do any of those people making all of those predictions. Instead of predictions, I'll be going through Cinema Wellman's Oscar ballot as if we were given a vote, as if someone would give us a vote. Um, I believe in spreading the wealth, so try to keep that in mind as I fill out the 2023 Oscar ballot. I'm going to attempt to award at least one vote or award to every film on the ballot that I enjoyed and would recommend, if at all possible. As of this recording, I have screened 51 of the 54 total films nominated across the 23 total categories. I'm waiting for the other three remaining films to become available, and if I need to make changes to the ballot in the future, uh, I will mention it down the road. Uh, I'm not going to mention all the nominees in the categories, so you may want to have your own Oscar ballot in front of you while watching or listening. All nominees, along with our second choices in each category, are available on the blog, which you can always find at cinemawellman.com. So let's begin. We're going to start with the short film animated category. I've always thought that the shorts, both animated and live action, don't get the credit that they deserve. I've always looked at them like the short stories, with features being the novels in the comparison. It's extremely difficult to tell a good story in a short amount of time, whether it's on paper or film. Uh, kudos to the filmmakers who continue to accept the challenge and produce quality shorts. I've only seen four of the five animated shorts uh, so far, and I'm looking forward to whatever that ostrich movie is going to be about. Um, Cinema Wellman's vote is going to The Boy, The Mole, The Fox, and The Horse. This fable follows the three animals as they help the boy search for a home. I love the positivity in the film and how it inspires you to be kind and accepting of others no matter where you come from. And the disclaimer at the end of this film is perfect. No cakes were harmed in the making of this film. I love that and I loved the mole. Next category is short film live action. Here's another category that features a missing entry as far as my viewing is concerned, but I don't think it'll change my vote after seeing the fifth nominee. That's how much I enjoyed Ivalu. Uh, have you been to Greenland? I don't think I've, I know anyone who has been to Greenland, and its beauty is on display in this film, and the beauty is beyond belief. The film is only 16 minutes long, and it's packed full of gorgeous scenery. The beautiful scenery in this film can also be harsh and brutal, much like the topic of this short and the themes that it explores, all in only 16 minutes. There's more feeling and emotion in the 16 minutes of Ivalu than in the entire 192 minutes of Avatar, The Way of Water. That is not an exaggeration. Our next category is documentary short film. I have not yet seen How Do You Measure a Year, and it looks delightful. I'm looking forward to seeing that. For now, Cinema Wellman's vote in this category is cast for the Marshall, Martha Mitchell effect, simply because I was a Watergate kid. According to the interwebs, the Watergate scandal took place between June of 1972 and August of 1974 making me 10 to 12 years old during the mess, and I soaked it all up like a sponge. I was fascinated by the idea of corruption in our presidency. I was still young enough to think that all presidents in my country were honorable, honorable men, and boy, did that change right around this time. This documentary short brought me right back to those days when I couldn't wait to get home from school to watch the Watergate hearings on television. Seeing those rogues and their puppet master again <laughs> brought back a lot of memories. Halderman, Ehrlichman, Dean, Liddy, and that crooked bastard Nixon pulling the strings made for some amazing viewing back then. This film brings it all back with Martha Mitchell at the forefront. 
She was quite a character to say the least. If you watch this, you'll totally understand why Nixon hated her so much and probably wanted her dead. She was that dangerous to him. The next category is documentary feature film. All of the attention is going to Fire of Love in this category, but I don't get it. I love nature documentaries, but I didn't buy into it for some reason. There were actually three films on this list that I liked more um, in this category. Cinema Wellman's vote goes to A House Made of Splinters, a heartbreaking documentary about, uh, about an institution in Ukraine that houses children who have been removed from their homes while waiting for court custody decisions. Listening to these young people talk frankly about their neglectful, abusive parents is genuinely sad. As a father, I watched this and wanted to adopt every one of these kids. I was happy and encouraged to see that the people who run this institution are very caring and loving people. These children certainly deserve someone in their lives who loves them. The next category is music original song. Now, if you're a regular here at Cinema Wellman, you know my struggle with this category. The best original song category has caused me to watch so many horrible movies over the years. I had to sit through Fifty Shades of Grey because of this category. That remains one of the worst things that I have ever seen. I'm here to tell you that dozens and dozens of awful movies over the years have been nominated in this category and nothing else. This year is an exception. Uh, as there are a few good choices and a few really good movies. Um, I really enjoyed Lift Me Up from Black Panther, Wakanda Forever, but a movie I truly loved, RRR, was only nominated in this category, so I have to go with Natu Natu from RRR. RRR is a tremendous action-adventure film from India that is unlike anything I have ever seen. The action sequences and CGI effects are phenomenal. It's three hours and seven minutes long, but it doesn't seem like it. There's just too much going on. The three R's stand for Rise, Roar, Revolt. And the movie is about two legendary revolutionaries who are fighting for their country in the 1920s. This is an amazing film, and the song at the end is unbelievably fun. The movie is worth watching for this song over the closing credits alone. This is masterful filmmaking, and I highly recommend that you see RRR. Set aside three hours and, and watch it. It's, it's wild stuff. The next category is music original score. Now, John Williams is the sentimental favorite here, scoring his 25th and final film for Steven Spielberg, but I'm not buying into any sentimentality here. Williams has already won five Oscars, three of them for scoring movies directed by Spielberg. Been there, done that. Instead, Cinema Wellman will vote for Justin Hurwitz's score for The Amazing Babylon. I think Babylon was overlooked with only three nominations, half of what Top Gun Maverick got, which is patently absurd. Babylon is an assault on the senses that has to be seen to be believed. The excess of early Hollywood is on full display, elephant poop and all. The next category is sound. I have a greater appreciation for sound in movies after watching a 2019 documentary titled Making Waves, The Art of Cinematic Sound. I believe that made a top 10 list one month of a previous episode. If you think that all there is to movie sound is a person with a boom mic recording everything, you need to see that documentary. Sound in movies is an extremely complex art that layers multiple audio tracks to form one complete and cohesive sound. There is, of course, the dialogue track. Add to that the background sound, sound effects, the score, and the sound created by the magical work of the Foley artists. It's an amazing process. Sound in movies is like the umpires in a baseball game. You shouldn't notice it if it's doing its job. I think a lot of people take sound in movies for granted. The next time you watch a movie, pay attention to all of the sound you're hearing. And I guarantee you those sounds are on multiple tracks that were not recorded live during that scene. Cinema Wellman's vote goes to All Quiet on the Western Front because, like many war movies, the sound is extremely important in helping put us in the trenches and vividly hear 
not only hear and see the horrors of war. Next category is makeup and hairstyling. Uh, sorry, not going for the fat suits, either of them. I've gone on record with my feelings about the prosthetic blub blubber, and I won't change my mind. Our vote is going to Black Panther Wakanda forever. I have always thought that makeup and hairstyling go hand in hand to, with a, to a certain degree with costume design. They all work together to help create the illusion of another time or place, and it works magnificently in Black Panther Wakanda forever. And speaking of costume design, that's the next category. As I just mentioned, costume design go hand in hand with makeup and hairstyling. Since our makeup and hairstyling vote went to Black Panther Wakanda Forever, we will double up and give them the nod for costume design as well. Babylon was a close second, but some of the costumes in Black Panther Wakanda Forever were absolutely stunning. I've always thought that it was tougher to create costumes for a place that never existed than to look back at photos and replicate the actual past from a place that did exist. Next category is production design. There was so much to look at in Babylon, so much to pay attention to. As mentioned earlier, excess is the name of the game in this movie, and the production design in Babylon brings every bit of that excess to life in a grand fashion. I'm one of those people that pays very close attention to production design in a movie, and when a crew does it right, it's just a beautiful thing. Not everything in Babylon is beautiful, not by a long shot, but the sets, props, lighting, etc. are all masterfully done. Uh, in a visceral, visual film, the wonderful production design helps create the reality of early Hollywood's debauchery. Next category is visual effects. Now, this category is always challenging for me because of the mixed feelings I have about CGI. I think that too much CGI can actually ruin a movie. Take 2012, for example. The effects in that movie were fantastic, but the movie was ludicrous due in part to those very effects being just too much to believe, even when suspending so much belief to begin with. It may sound strange, but I prefer my effects in movies that are grounded in reality. It's one of the reasons I'd never cast a vote for Avatar The Way of Water. As I said before, just make a damn cartoon. Cinema Wellman's vote is cast for All Quiet on the Western Front because of its heart-pounding war sequences. These effects added to the overall story without being front and center. I believed I was watching a World War I battle because of the stellar visual effects employed by the filmmakers. I don't like to be distracted by the visual effects in a movie. I prefer that they add to the production instead of dominating it. That's exactly how the effects were utilized in All Quiet on the Western Front, and that's why they got our vote. Next is writing adapted screenplay. As much as I love Ryan Johnson and his films Knives Out and Glass Onion, I have to go with longtime friend of Cinema Wellman since 1999, Sarah Polly, and her screenplay for Women Talking. Women Talking is an amazing film shot in such a unique way that it deserves to get more attention than it seems to be getting. Yes, I realize it was nominated for Best Picture, but it seems insincere since the only other nomination it received was for Adapted Screenplay. Sarah Polly's screenplay is so important in the film because it's mostly, you know, women talking. And none of those women were nominated in the acting categories, which is ridiculous. Polly also directed this film and continues to hone her skills behind the camera. She could have easily been included in the best director category, in my opinion. I will see every movie she makes in her career, and I look forward to what's to come from her. One more thing, the fact that Top Gun Maverick is included in this category pisses me off so much. That screenplay could have been written by a drunk monkey. Next, writing original screenplay. I have always associated the original screenplay Oscar with movies that the Academy is kind of afraid to honor in any other category. For example, Pulp Fiction, Almost Famous, Promising Young Woman, Get Out, Her, Juno, Lost in Translation, Dog Day Afternoon, and The Hospital only won one Oscar each, and that Oscar was for original screenplay. There are tremendous movies on that list that should have won multiple Oscars. 
Unfortunately, that didn't happen. And again, I blame the Academy. This year's, well, that movie fits the mold, goes to Ruben Ostlin's Triangle of Sadness, which is an unflinching look at class and power and vomit. Let's not forget the vomit. I wonder what those pages look like on the script. I loved that movie, even the vomit. And vomit was a thing in this year's 54 nominated films. I didn't keep a track while I was watching them all, but Triangle of Sadness is awarded four vomit buckets, uh, but Barf was also prominently featured in scenes from Babylon and The Whale. Hell, even Marcel the Shell with shoes on vomits in his movie twice. <laughs> What's going on? I don't get all the vomit. Next, film editing. When I watched Everything, Everywhere, All at Once, I was blown away by a lot of it. There's so much to see, and there are times that you feel like your senses are being assaulted, in a good way, of course. It seems like a movie that was impossible to shoot was even more impossible to edit. If you've seen it, you know what I mean. I think editor Paul Rogers deserves a double Oscar for his effort on this film. The next category is cinematography. Some excellent films on this short list. When this category is awarded, it will go to a worthy cinematographer slash film. You may say that that should be true for all of the categories, but I would disagree with you. I really enjoyed Empire of Light, but Cinema Wellman's vote is going to Darius Kanji and Bardo False Chronicles of a Handful of Truths. It's directed by Alejandro G. Inaritu, so you know it's going to be worth seeing right off the bat. I'll let IMDb handle the synopsis because it's a little hard to describe. An acclaimed journalist turned documentarian goes on an generic introspective journey to reconcile with the past, the present, and his Mexican identity. Barley was beautifully shot with several dreamlike surrealistic sequences. The movie poster actually tells the truth for a change. It reads, a breathtaking experience. I couldn't agree more. Next category is animated feature film. When I saw that Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio was nominated in this category, I knew right away that none of the other films had a chance. I absolutely adore his films and look forward to watching anything he's involved in. I personally hate the actual story of Pinocchio, but I knew del Toro would do a much better job than anyone who had attempted it before, and I was right. Stop-motion animation films are always amazing to watch, but when you sit and think about how they actually create them, it's mind-blowing. This film took 40 animators 940 days to capture. That is some painstaking work right there, and I'd love to see it honored. Our next category is international feature film. I saw a comment online that suggested that the donkey from EO host SNL, and after watching the movie, I think he could pull it off. EO is a Polish film that uniquely tells the story of the life of a donkey from the donkey's perspective. EO journeys throughout Europe encountering both good and bad people, experiencing joy and sadness. It's beautifully shot and edited, and the final product is unforgettable, especially the ending. See EO if you can, especially if you're an animal lover. EO is quite lovable. The next category is directing. I recently stated that I don't understand how the best Oscar doesn't for directing doesn't automatically go to the director of the best picture winner every single year. And here I am voting for the directors of a film I didn't vote for for best picture. So I guess I can understand how that can happen. I just think that what the Daniels, Quan and Shiner, pulled off with everything, everywhere, all at once is something that needs to be awarded multiple Oscars. And since I didn't vote for it for Best Picture, I wanted to do what I consider the next best thing. Spielberg will be the sentimental favorite in this category, but that doesn't mean much to me. He's already won two. I'm for giving someone else some recognition. Not that there should be a cap on how many Oscars you can win, but it shouldn't be a knee-jerk reaction based solely on past performance either. Next category is actor in a supporting role. I was mesmerized by the complexity of Brendan Gleeson's character in The Banshees of Inge Sharon. 
Gleason always creates compelling characters and is adept at both drama and comedy. His Banshee's character, Colm Dougherty, makes some outrageous decisions, making him a character you can't take your eyes off of. Simply put, I really like Brendan Gleeson, and I'd love to see him win an Oscar. That's the reason for my vote here. I'm way less complicated than Colm Dougherty. Next is Actress in a Supporting Role. This category is filled with worthy nominees. I still can't understand why the entire cast of Women Talking got shut out of the acting categories, but that's what makes the Academy the entity I love to question and oftentimes hate. Angela Bassett was wonderful in Black Panther Wakanda Forever, and I would be very happy if she won an Oscar for her performance. She's an excellent actress who deserves recognition. That being said, Cinema Wellman's vote is going to go to longtime friend of Cinema Wellman, Jamie Lee Curtis. Her pictures graced my dorm walls 40 years ago at BU. The scream queen of the heyday of slasher films has certainly made her mark on the world of cinema. I also think she's a good human being who's intelligent and honest and sassy as hell. I'd love to see her win an Oscar. I love the idea of Laurie Strode winning an Oscar. Next, we have actor in a leading role. I loved Paul Mescal's performance in After Sun and I'm interested to see what he does next, but I'm not ready to vote for someone who was so early in the career in such a major category as this. I'm actually going to say the same thing about Austin Butler and Elvis. I had seen Butler in three of his previous movies, and he didn't make much of an impact on me. He was excellent as Elvis, but I want to see where he goes from here not playing Elvis and using that voice. Brendan Fraser is getting a lot of support for a win, and I get it. It certainly is a career resurrection for him, and he does seem like a decent enough guy. I'm rooting for him in his future endeavors. But Cinema Wellman's vote is going to go to Colin Farrell in The Banshees of Inna Sharon. Colin Farrell has had a very interesting career. I enjoyed some of his early cheese, such as Minority Report, The Recruit, and the always wonderful phone booth. He then showed me he could actually act and in a variety of genres uh, with his roles in in Bruges, Horrible Bosses, and especially The Lobster, which I consider an amazing movie. Farrell's performance in The Banshees of Inner Sharon is wonderfully sweet, and he shares his character's confusion about his situation with the audience in a way that has us rooting for him to sort out his problems in his remote little isolated town where everyone knows everyone else's business. I'd love to see him win an Oscar for his performance. Next, we have Actress in a Leading Role. Kate Blanchett was in two nominated movies this year. Did you know that? She obviously plays Lydia Tarr and is nominated for that role, but she's also in Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio as the voice of Spazatora the monkey. She has very few lines, and her performance is mostly noises. Blanchett has gone on record as saying that she loves Del Toro so much she would do anything for him, including playing a pencil. Much love here to the, to the two-time winner, Kate Blanchett. She's one of the most talented actresses of, the, uh, of this era uh, and could very well walk off with her third Oscar here. If she does, I will not be upset. I love her, but I'm casting my vote for Michelle Yeoh for her performance in Everything, Everywhere, All at Once. Michelle Yeoh has been kicking ass on screen since the mid-80s, and she gets our best actress vote for being the anchor, if that's possible, of a movie that's absolutely bananas. I cannot imagine what that shoot was like. So many things going on in so many dimensions. It's like everything is coming at you from everywhere all at once. Uh, Okay, all right, I get it. I think I'll let IMDb's synopsis, it's perfect, so I'll share it with you. A middle-aged Chinese immigrant is swept up into an insane adventure in which she alone can save existence by exploring other universes and connecting with the lives she could have led. If existence itself is in one person's hand, hands, I'd go with Michelle Yeoh to save us. Yeah, she's that good. And next we have, and lastly, we have the Best Picture category. And if you're a regular here at Cinema Wellman, you already know who got our vote for Best Picture since we did an entire episode breaking down all 10 nominees. 
that episode, like all other Cinema Wellman episodes, can be heard on Spotify, watched on YouTube, and you already know that, I'm sure. Uh, we did cast our vote for The Banshees of Inner Sharon because we liked it the most of the 10 Best Picture nominees. It's as simple as that. That's why we voted for it. Well, that's it for our Oscar ballot reveal or whatever they'd call it in Hollywood. If you're attending an Oscar viewing party, have a blast. Special shout out to my mom's Oscar party, which is still going strong. They're altering the concept a little bit this year, but the love is still there. And I know my mom is there in spirit as well. Have fun, ladies. Wherever you're watching, have fun with whoever you're with. Don't forget to fill out a ballot and enjoy debating the winners and the losers and talking about what everyone is wearing. It wouldn't be the Oscars without that part. I just hope nobody gets hurt this year. Join us next week for A Farewell to Netflix, A Long Love Affair Comes to a Partial End. And until then, take care.